talk for a minute about hamsters. Hamsters are prolific runners. They love to run. In fact, sometimes they run for hours, all night long. They can cover up to six miles without stopping. I'm not even sure I can do that myself anymore. <laughs> In fact, I'm pretty sure I couldn't. Of course, the challenge is they're, they're not going anywhere. They're literally running in circles. And I wonder if that's a bit what your life feels like at times. If you're, you're not really getting anywhere. It feels like you're running in circles. If you don't know where you're going, you probably won't know if you get there. In fact, you'll probably be constantly changing course, uh, caught up in an endless cycle of failing to lead, reacting and, and not leading. This COVID-19 has certainly uh, exposed our vulnerability. Uh, we, we've been caught off guard. This, I mean, it's, th these things have never happened in the history of the world. And, and yet we should know better. We, we, we've, we have an example, in fact, in the uh, Old Testament, by a group of men called the Sons of Issachar. And, and although we don't know very much about them, we know one thing in particular that inspires me. These, these men were able to discern the times in which they lived. They understood what was going on around them. And the direct result was they were given the opportunity to lead. In fact, over 200 chiefs followed them with all of their armies. What an opportunity. Only because, specifically because, they knew what was going on. So I, got, I have three challenges for you today. Number one, run your race. We, we tend to treat life like a series of 100 yard dashes or 100 meter dashes. We're, we're, we're stopping and starting, stopping and starting and, and, and always moving the finishing line in the, in the process. I think, I'd, I think I'd rather picture life as more like a marathon. And I'm told that all good marathon leaders uh, visit the goal. Now we're talking about maybe 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers. They, they visit the goal in advance. They, 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 they walk out the course, they, 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 they examine the course, they, they, know, they know what the course looks like, but then they visit the, the, the finish line in particular and then visualize. They take a picture right there in their head. This is what the picture, this is what the finish line looks like. Very helpful because, man, in, in a marathon, there, there'll be moments when you feel like you're, you're gonna, you're gonna die. Your, your lungs are exploding. Your legs are, are, are like lead. But if, if you know where the finish line is, you know what it looks like. If you, if you have a, the joy of a prize set before you, you keep on running. So what is your prize? What is your personal definition of fulfillment? And, and again, that's, that's not a, a trick question because it, it'll mean different things to different people. I, I hope you're running in that direction. And if you, if you do, you'll know the finish line when you see it. It's really easy to be busy, but are you, are you, are you doing what, what you were made for? I, uh, I had a couple of great professors, several great professors when I was in graduate school. And one of my favorite was Dr. John Grayson. Dr. Grayson had been a uh, missionary for many years in uh, Africa, in, in, the, in the Congo, and came back to the States and, and uh, uh, became a professor at the, at the graduate school. And uh, he, he was a great lecturer, inspiring man, um, but he gave terrible exams. Well, at least they were terrible to me. Uh, I guess some people thought they were more like a game. I, I thought they were more like torture. <laughs> so so they went something like this. There were usually 50 questions, all multiple choice, or sometimes we'd say multiple guess. And he would always introduce the exam by saying, there'll be four choices for each question, A, B, C, or D. Only one is correct. Now, there'd be several of them that appeared to be correct. In fact, they are correct. But I'm not looking for the correct one. I'm looking for the best one. He would say like this, the enemy of the best is the good. And I wonder what good things in your life are robbing you. Too many businesses fail because they don't know what they're good for, what, what, their, what their product is, and stick to that product. Too many, too many individuals run so many races that they're not really running any of them very well. That's a, let's stop for a minute and uh, watch this video clip about Winston Churchill. My favorite prime minister is this man right here, Winston Churchill. He was an incredible leader for our country and indeed for the whole free world at the most impossibly difficult time. Just a few yards away from here is the cabinet room and Winston Churchill as prime minister sat in that cabinet room and decided with his colleagues to fight on against Nazi Germany and Hitler even after France had fallen. 
That was a heroic decision, a right decision, and actually meant that the world was saved from Nazi tyranny. It was the most important moment in British history, and I think it's because of his courage and guts that we made the right call. Behind Winston Churchill, we stand united as never before in history. Well, obviously, he came to office in 1940 uh, at a desperately difficult time. France was about to fall. The war was going extraordinarily badly from Britain's point of view. Uh, Hitler was rampant across Europe. It looked like uh, the end for the free world, the end for Britain, and the end for, for Churchill too. Um, but he showed incredible bravery, incredible courage at bringing the nation together, forging a courageous spirit, taking on Hitler, and eventually winning. Um, so it was a very difficult time for Britain, a time when you needed the best possible leader, the most courageous possible leader to come forward. And in Winston Churchill, we were incredibly fortunate to have that man. Now, Winston Churchill was quite a man, and famous, I'm sure you've heard his, his, his name before, but the reality is, until he was 71, he lived pretty much the life of an outcast. Uh, he, he made terrible mistakes. He had poor grades in school, left in, 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 uh, finished in a military academy, joined the Royal Cavalry in 19, rather than 1895. He lost his first election. In fact, he lost several elections. In fact, he was ultimately uh, placed by his party in a district that was so strongly of that party that they knew anyone from that party could win. That's how he got into parliament. Uh, he actually switched political parties later on. Not, not exactly the popular thing to do. Made several very serious mistakes. Probably the best well-known one is the disastrous Gallipoli, Gallipoli campaign when he was the, the first out, Lord of the Admiralty. Uh, while he was leading the finance department, he led England back onto the gold standard, which appeared to be the right thing at the time, but turned out to be, again, a disastrous decision. Probably, probably the most disappointing was his stand on, 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 on the nationhood of, of many of the colonies that had been part of the colonial empire. And especially India, he fought, he fought hard against India becoming a nation. Terrible mistakes. But after 11 years out of office, 11 years not in parliament, he recognized that things were, 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 were changing in the world. In fact, he recognized before anyone else did that a man named Hitler was about ready to, to turn Europe in particular, really most of the world, upside down. And, 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 and when he was called upon at age 71, he knew what was going on. He understood the times. He was able to lead in England and really, really led the, in many ways, the free world. Those five years from 71 to 76 changed the world because he knew how to discern the times. So, so what, what is your, what are you being prepared, being prepared for? What, 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 what mix of gifts has God given you? What, what special talents and abilities? Can you even learn from your mistakes and put them to good use when your time comes? Let me say it this way, embrace your prize. Know what your prize is and embrace it. Run your race, not someone else's. Comparison is the competition you cannot win. Let me say it again. Comparison is the competition that you cannot win. Because there's always someone better. There always will be someone better. Jesus gives this interesting uh, parable and in illustration in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 45. He says, in the kingdom of heaven, there is like a, there's a, is like a, unto a merchant man who's seeking a good, goodly pearls, when he found the right one, one of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What is it that you're willing to sell everything you have for? What is your prize? Okay, so number one, run your race. But number two, run your pace. Again, too often we're comparing ourselves to others and trying to keep up with others, running the wrong marathon. Uh, the Sydney to Marathon, Sydney to Melbourne Ultra Marathon is one of the most demanding uh, marathons in the whole world. It's uh, 875 kilometers, takes five days to run, upwards to 150 participants come from all over the world, professionals who train and, and prepare to do so. In 1983, Clifford Young uh, uh, signed up to run the race. And when he showed up, everyone had a hard time kind of taking him seriously. Cliff was 61 years old. He showed up in his farmer bib overalls and he's called Oshes, uh, and he said, I'm ready to run. Now, you know, these, these guys were professionals. They've got these slick suits on and, and, and the, the most expensive shoes. They've been training all their lives. And, 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 and at first, no one took him serious. Here's what Cliff said. You see, I grew up on a farm where we couldn't afford horses 
or four wheel drives. And the whole time I was growing up, whenever the storms came rolling in, I had to go out and round up the sheep. We had 2,000 head on 2,000 acres. Sometimes I'd have to run those sheep for two or three days. It took a long time, but I would catch them. I believe I can run this race. It's only two more days. Five days, I've run sheep for three already. Well, Cliff ran, and uh, sure enough, he won the race. Now, <laughs> you're saying, how is that possible? Well, he started off way behind. In fact, it, it was kind of laughable at first. People were kind of making fun of him, like, when's this guy going to quit? And, and after a while, the cameras begin to follow him from the TV and, and, and the reporters, and, and uh, he's, he's falling behind, falling behind. And, and then he got, after a couple, couple of days there, so he began to, little by little, start catching up. And uh, at the end of the day, he, he actually beat the then, known, the then record for the race by nine hours. Now, how in the world did he do that? Well, really, it's, it's pretty simple. Cliff didn't understand that if you're going to run for five days, you need to actually have a pattern of, of running for 18 hours and then sleeping for six hours. 18 off, six on. Cliff just, just really never went to sleep. He maybe caught a couple naps here and there, but he, just, he kept his pace. He kept his place. I, I, I see those galoshes now, kablum, kablum, kablum. Just, just moving on. And, and by the time the race ended, he, he ended up at, at the, the winner. Now, now, there's a challenge for you. Don't compare yourself to others. Run your race, but run your pace. Sometimes it's not the, the hare that wins, but the tortoise, by consistently and knowing, consistency and knowing where you're going. Uh, are you ready to change? Are you ready to make a difference? Number three, then I challenge you to run with grace. Run your race, run your pace, but then run with grace. Specifically, the grace of God, the empowerment, the, 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 the energy, the, 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 the anointing, the, 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 the power that comes from only from God. You see, we as followers of Jesus, his disciples have distinct advantages. I could go on for quite a time, quite a time on this one, but let me just highlight a couple of thoughts. Number one, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus teaches us in John 15 that if we abide in him, he'll abide in us. He uses the illustration of a vine and a branch. He's the vine, we're the branch. And if we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. That's how you find fulfillment when you're abiding in Jesus. Number, number two, he, he knows what's coming. We have an advantage because we're following the one who knows, knows it all. And, and he's never surprised. I think I need to remind myself about that from time to time. Uh, he's never surprised. Peace can be yours at all times because you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So run your race, run your pace, but run with grace, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Lord Jesus. So this is the first of five seminars, five webinars, and I'll be continuing my thoughts on leading or reacting Next time, I'll be talking about some evidences of a reactionary style of leadership. Before I close, let me, let me quote from, from, from the Apostle Paul. Here's what Paul says. Do you not know that in a race, all runners run, but only one received the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Run your race. Run your pace. Run with grace. God bless you. Thank you for joining us.